back to the flotilla. So I'm supposed to learn the names or name of the saints from the displeased. So let's try to appease the displeased. So which one is it? Crow's Nest? Yes, the displeased. Sing of loss. Displeased. Confession. Confess an air of despair. Oh, that was for the sanctified. What will you do with the confession you've heard? Betray it. The displeased. Dying at the feast. Mm, with restraint. Displeased. There we go. This seems to have done it. Attend to last rite. As the other cultists are departing, your acquaintances among the displeased bid you join them. They warn you not to hope for a reward. Hmm, that didn't do it. An unhappiness of poetry. You're brought to an abandoned cabin, mired in flows of ice and adrift from the rest of the flotilla. You are bidden to take a seat amid a circle of chairs. In the center is the silent mystic, tied to a chair. The displeased have observed, uh, followed the observance as well, she explains. So I have agreed to submit to one of their rites. She waves a hand. Do go on, dear. Tell me what manner of fool now rules in my old halls. It is poetry of the celestial school, beloved of her majesty's court. It is sublime and dreadful. Once the reading is over, the leader of the displeased insists you take the slim volume of poetry. It will not bring you joy, she insists. So that's who the silent mystic is. They're tied to the displeased. I think I might need to actually just full on try to join the displeased, not just do this thing, but like, you know, you know, like get the, the leader of them, the silent mystic, I guess, to try to help me somehow. Mm. Make an offering for more time on the flotilla. Speak to the silent mystic. Are you willing to speak with me now? Ask her for a secret of the Abbot Horizon. No. This is unlocked when I am super lipsarian. Hmm. Is there any way to get rid of that? Talk to the Jolly Anchorite to become a full initiate of the Sanctified. Hmm. I'm not sure how to do this. I guess I could do the same thing that I just did. Maybe it'll make the displeased like me more. They already told me what to do. What sucks is this is going to get laggier and laggier and I can't get out of it without it making me wait. Yeah, I guess all I can do is try to please the displeased again. Which one did I mess up? It wasn't the first one. Crow's Nest, that is the displeased. Sing of Loss. That is the displeased. <clears throat> Confess despair. That was the one that was wrong. Air of sentiment. That's displeased.
What will I do with the confessions? Betray them? Dine at the feast. Restraint. You are despised, that rarest and most precious gift. A jewel in the crown of loathing. Cool. Tend to last, last right again. The displeased have discovered you. They do not like you. Is that better than I did last time? Well, let me do that whole thing again. Yeah, I did it a couple more times and it didn't do anything different. Just gave me more ministry stamp permits. Or literature? It was literature. I think what I need to do is leave an offering to get a different person. Because the offering you leave is how I managed to meet both of the, like, the superlipsarian person and the sanctified person. So for the displeased, I probably have to leave an offering of a body. Let's just not think about the fact that I'm killing my own crew. Let's just say I found out the crew are like, I don't know, serial killers or something. So I'm just like pulling a Dexter. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Hmm. That didn't do anything, did it? It didn't do anything at the moment, I think, because I have to wait to return to the flotilla. Right, is there any point in approaching the gate? Other than a shitload of terror? Three sky stories? Sit in contemplation? Just a description. Okay, I need to wait. Finally entered back into the flotilla, but nothing actually changed. However, going through the usual thing of dining at the feast and singing and confessions and all that stuff, I think I found what I was missing. Before dining at the feast, there's a separate option to dine with the cultist who dines alone. This acolyte sets apart from the other displeased. The woman carves a slab of meat the size of a piglet. The woman passes you a fork with a thin strip of flesh impaled on the prongs. She uses a small brazier to heat each morsel. The heat never quite reaches the center. It has a chill that won't shift, and a saltiness that suggests it was stored in the sea. She passes you piece after piece, but your jaw aches with chewing long before you can be satisfied. Oh. I just... that was more cannibalism. <laughs> the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. So that wasn't it? Huh. Is the last rite any different? I might just be screwed because I already did the Superlipsarians. So maybe I can't do the Silent Mystic. Because of what it said about... Because I've spoken the whatever of the Superlipsarians. That seems to be why the Silent Mystic won't really talk to me. Hey, wait a minute. Um, I just found a, a ship. Like a full ship, like the Behringer. Right here, wreck of the boatman. I was heading from the Royal Society to the Clockwork Sun. Oh, yes, and uh, I think I... I think you last saw me at the Quiet Sea. It seems like I really can't continue that quest because of the Super Lipsarian thing, so... I'm just going to drop it. But yes, look at this. A black hulk in the mist, an old necropolis train, I think it said. Yeah, that even... Something's pushing me around, I think. Oh, no. I was just being an incompetent pilot. Anyway, this definitely does look like a necropolis train. You can see it wiggling all around. It's quite long, and they look like coffins, don't they? The cars. A wreck drifts just ahead. Fierce winds rock it like an empty cradle. Its black and silver bulk gleams in your lights as you search for its nameplate, the boatman. 
Captain, a signaler wants your attention. That's a Necropolis line engine. Brought the dead to Memoriam. His eyes widen. But it disappeared one eve. They say the dead woke and commandeered the train. A nonsense, I'm, I'm sure. He doesn't look convinced. Prepare to board the bootman. Your signaler crosses himself. Your pilot grazes the wreck's hull and has to reverse. Your navigator's hand slips while winching the locomotives close. A clang resounds throughout your engine. When you finally docked, you select a few of your crew to join you. The outer door to the boatman is rhymed with frost. The bolts shriek as they're pulled across. Inside, your torchlight reveals a narrow corridor in somber black, opening onto darker doorways, likely the crew cabins. There is a long moan from somewhere deeper in the engine. Probably the boilers, your stoker whispers. Pressing forward through the cabin, you hear the rattle of something that might be chains. A bolt loose in the chassis, your stoker suggests, less confidently. Hmm. Oh, trespassing on the boatman. You have entered the wreck of the boatman, trespasser. A ghastly engine. The boatman is as dark and cold as the grave. Gas lights flicker on the walls, none substantial enough to illuminate more than the empty doorways ahead. A shattered window in the galley is responsible for the merciless cold. The source of the faint but insistent knocking is less clear. Explore the boatman. What happened here? Light in hand, you wander the empty cabins and carriages. The floor of the boiler room is scarred with scorch marks. The captain's cabin is littered with pieces of furniture. There are bullets in the walls. There are no coffins aboard, but the hold is locked. A great groaning emanates from within. A hissing sound like that of an aggrieved cat comes from the galley. Bullets in the walls. Scorch marks, some sort of a mutiny? So I heard a noise in the galley. But I want to check out the crew cabins. Investigate them. The gas lights reveal only darkness. You can see nothing inside. The crew cabins are charmless and cramped. Crew slept, too, to a cabin. In some cases, the division of space was ruthlessly enforced. Here, a sheet has been pinned to the ceiling and floor, neatly halving the room. Someone knocks thrice on the wall in the next cabin. All your crew are behind you. A hasty scramble for the door reveals the next room is locked and barred from the outside. You order a burly stoker to bring down the door. Inside, the cabin is like the rest. Empty. Empty, that is, aside from the skeleton laid out on the bed in a cassock rather than the necropolis line uniform. The chaplain? A groaning can be heard from below, like the sound of a pipe before it bursts, or a particularly unhappy digestive tract. Investigate the engine room. Heat emanates from within. The air is as hot and dry as the heart of a work world. The incinerator has been switched on. Something is burning inside. Peering in, you can make out the remains of a bundle of black and silver uniforms smoldering into ash. Investigate the galley. Something rattles inside. A carelessly opened cupboard expels an array of personal effects. Brass cufflinks, a conductor's whistle, pewter mugs embellished with memento mori, brass polish for the coffin fixtures, charts of the routes to memoriam, the standard equipment of Necropolis Line staff. But where are the crew? You can hear weeping somewhere far away. Investigate the captain's cabin. At the end of this black walled corridor, the captain was afforded some measure of privacy from her crew. The room is spartan, 
The bed looks uncomfortable. Someone has arranged her pillows, and a surprising number of moldering stuffed toys, beneath her sheets, in the semblance of a sleeping form. The only other furniture in the room is a barren writing desk with a journal and a pen abandoned upon it. That should hold some clues. Someone arranged all of her stuff under the sheet so that it looked like there was somebody sleeping in it. That's... odd. Read the captain's log. Must offer hints as to the goings-on. Something unnatural abides here. Hmm. Reading the captain's log provides a few clues. 11th of September, 1903. Line manager insists we shave a day and a half from the round trip. Navigator plotted new course. 12th of September. Set to make memoriam in good time. 13th of September. Scout reports wefts of unraveled time on our bearing. Have instructed pilot to hold the course and our schedule. Oh, that's what happened. Wefts of unraveling time. That would make things funky, wouldn't it? You haven't found a single coffin, and the hold is locked from the outside. The captain would have her keys with her, but you've not found her body. Either the captain felt the need to lock the hold before abandoning her engine, or she's inside. The door is locked tight. Mm. Plunge through the corpse chute or force the door. Plunge through the corpse chute. That sounds fun. <laughs> Follow the progress of Albion's dead. A riskier proposition for you. A safer one for your crew. Coffins brought to Necropolis line ships are deposited through the corpse door, which opens onto a narrow chute leading into the hold. The metal groans with the weight and movement of a live body. Tormented fixings buckle. Your crew bang on the sides for you to get a move on. It's quite a squeeze, as the chute narrows like a throat, but with a final groan, you're expelled. You've breached the hold. A grave mistake. Mm. Behind the wreckage, you find a row of coffins like blackened teeth. There's a sudden muffled banging as if something is knocking on the underside of a lid. Either open the coffins or explore the hold. I'm not going to open it until I've explored. I mean, I think they've been here for years. I mean, the captain's log is from 1903. So they've been here for about nine years. Although, with wefts of unraveling time being involved, who knows. But still, they can wait another couple minutes. Explore the hold. There's signs of a fight. You move through the hold, which is as large as a wealthy family's mausoleum, casting your light before you. Shadows flee, revealing chains holding some of the coffins closed, scuff marks on the floor, a few shreds of black and silver cloth. An insistent scratching comes from a coffin, knocking from another. Your signaler startles and stumbles, falling face first onto a coffin, which rocks angrily. The lid slides off to reveal the boatman's captain, gagged, bound, and still very much alive. Did they hear us come in and, like, hid them? Like the spirits? Maybe? Footsteps approach, slowly as though dragged. Your stoker shrieks. Figures appear at the hold door, mantled in shadow. Look at the figures. Who are they? What do they want? You raise your torch, illuminating the figures in the door. This provokes shrieks from your crew. Sallow-skinned, hollow-eyed, decaying corpses are blocking your escape. Bloody rib cages, broken skulls, exposed bone, and sloughing flesh. Cadavers. Hmm. Pray. What good are weapons against the walking dead? Distressingly, the cadavers join in. Mumbling, rasping, and otherwise mangling the words. 
When you finish, the leader, a tall, tattered man in a stoker's uniform, thanks you. Very grateful to you for leading us in that, Captain. In the eerie light of your torch, you can make out moldering corpses. They stand in the doorway, silent as the grave. Approach the corpses. They are key to whatever befell the boatman. The leader extends one bony hand, its limb shaking from the weight of yet unsloughed flesh. I don't know if it's actually pronounced sloth, sloth, I, I'm not sure. Pull off the ridiculous corpse mask? Uh... Let's not do that. <laughs> Introduce yourself, it's only polite. The corpse nods stiffly. Its fingers close around your own. There's an uncomfortable moment where you almost leave with more fingers than you started with. But eventually, and with many a courteous, excuse me, you extract yourselves. We're glad you didn't run away, the skeleton says. The deceased stoker sends another corpse to fetch brandy for your crew. The captain, he says mournfully, had a habit. What the brandy lacks in quality, it makes up for in potency. Now, Stoker says, when the last of the glasses have been handed out, I think an explanation is required. Yes, hear the deceased Stoker out. He has more to say. Articulate for a dead man. I should apologize, he says. We've not had any visitors since the mutiny. Couldn't predict how you'd react. Driving you off with a haunting seemed safest. Almost had you. A decaying lady cackles. The fruit in her hat has fused with the exposed parts of her cranium. The stoker clears his crumbling throat. While our bodies were being transported, the captain steered us through a carelessness in time. Things have gotten tangled, you see. As far as our minds are concerned, we haven't died, but our bodies beg to differ. Vociferously, the last thing I remember from when I was alive is saying farewell to my husband then heading to the station. He looks down at the captain in her coffin. She's getting agitated again. We've been very decent, considering they tried to throw us into the incinerator the moment we climbed out of our boxes. Anyway, we thought we might face the same treatment elsewhere, so we set out into the wild. But here we are, stuck without fuel. We'd appreciate help. Hold on just a second. Articulate for a dead man, Faring, saying farewell to my husband, potentially Langley's lost lover? The boatman was the victim of an unfortunate accident. It's now crewed and captained by dead who were jolted awake by the collision with loose hours. The engine is out of fuel and supplies. It's living are trapped in coffins. Its dead are torn between returning to London and seeking a new home. Theirs is not an eternal rest, but rather an, rather an unhappy intermission. A lot of people to speak with. Um, speak with the happy dead. The deceased stoker leads a group of corpses eager to be off among the stars. The stoker adjusts his jaw to make his speech more intelligible. Damnable thing, really. Last thing I remember from life before this is wishing him goodbye. A sigh rattles through his skull. I wouldn't want him to see me like this. He gestures to the assemblage of cadavers behind him. It's the same for all of us. No idea what we'd go back to, or who, or if we'd even be allowed. Better to have a fresh start. Speak with the unhappy dead. The beheaded chaperone speaks, uh, rasps, on their behalf. I had a nice tea shop in London. Opened it with my birdie. We had words of a new strain coming in from Eleutheria. Last I know, I was on my way to the station to pick it up. 
She pauses to pluck a wax peach out from the fracture in her skull. All this, she gestures at her skeletal form, is just an inconvenience. Coming back is an opportunity, and one I'd be a fool to miss. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. Speak with the living, the captain and crew are strained in coffins. Their mouths are stained with the residue of corned beef, which the dead have been feeding them. The moment you remove the gag from the captain's mouth, she bursts into speech. Get us out of here! They close the coffin lids on us! I cannot bear another second! She pauses to regain a degree of self-control. I know we were a bit hasty popping them in the incinerator, but it was horrible. Coffins busting open, shrieking bodies wondering where their tea was or why they couldn't see. She shudders. But please, this is a nightmare. Arrange to take the living home. Yeah, that's fair. We'd appreciate having our coffins back, the deceased stoker says. You haul the captain out of her coffin. The dead keep their distance, perhaps sensing their help is unlikely to be appreciated. Bloody savior you are, the captain whispers. Come on, lads. All aboard the captain's train. We'll sort out what we're going to say to the line manager on the way back. The crew of the boatmen leave their train for yours. Your quartermaster can arrange the details of their crossing and provisioning. You're escorting the crew of the boatmen to the most serene mausoleum. Okay. Arrange to take the grumbling dead back to London. The beheaded chaperone is making pointed remarks about the contents of the deceased stoker's skull. The happy dead won't leave until they have the engine to themselves. The chaperone gasps. You would? Oh, I can smell my old tea shop already. Her voice gives out, but she conveys her feelings via a sudden crushing embrace. Bones crack before she releases you. Fortunately, only hers. Your quartermaster can arrange the details of their trip back. Mm hmm So, London and the Mausoleum. I've already spoken with the Happy Dead. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Return to your locomotive. You've done all you can here. It's time to get back underway. The Stoker waves. Your visit was well-timed. We were running out of corned beef. Without our guests, we can burn the spare coffins. That'll get us enough. Uh, that'll give us far enough to refuel. Return to London and the mausoleum for your rewards. I'm so glad that there actually was a boat in Albion. That makes me wonder. Does that mean there is one in Eletheria? I mean, not Eletheria, uh, the Blue Kingdom. And I've just missed it, but if I missed it, then where could it possibly be? I'm... I mean... Almost, it could be pretty much almost nowhere. It's like a tiny, tiny, tiny little spot here and here, and I guess like kinda here. I really doubt it's there though. This very most corner next to the Forge of Souls. Hmm. Well, let's head on over to the Clockwork Sun before I head back to London in the mausoleum. Let's complete my charitable assignment to the Sequencer. Remember we delivered the guns to an orphanage at London? A hand settles on your shoulder. From here on out, the coffers of Azimuth are dedicated entirely to the betterment of mankind, says the Sequencer breathlessly. Together we'll bring light to even the darkest regions of Albion. I hope you'll join me in a hymn. Without waiting for your answer, he launches into a breathless hymn. You don't know the words, but do a credible job of mumbling along. From now on, the sequencer will follow your advice when making his donations to charity. So yeah, this seems like a kind of infinite quest. So I doubt this is going to go anywhere. 
World rejects to mare. There was an option down here. Convince the sequencer to do something something. I accidentally skipped past it. Back at London, let's deposit the dead. Home at long last. Your crew will be pleased to have them off the train. All in all, your navigator admits they've not been bad passengers. Despite their insistence on joining the crew for meals, watching enviously and, in one regrettable instance, dropping a jawbone into the stew. The beheaded chaperone sees her charges off the engine with efficiency and tenderness. Her charges slowly disappear into the teeming smog of London. When the last has gone, she turns to you. Would you come with me? I'm not, I'm not sure how my husband will take my return. Sure. There might be tea at the end of it. She rubs her skull. In case you can't tell, Captain, I'm smiling. She leads you through crowded thoroughfares to a quiet street, just behind St. Dominic's. There, a little tea shop is waiting. Her husband sits inside. While tea for three steeps, he weeps. When he eventually composes himself, you're repaid for her return, with tea as well as coin. Hmm. The dead have passed on to resume their lives in London. At the mausoleum. Gonna finish a prospect here. Five things of Novartine gemstones. Bonus. A little bit of bonus sovereigns, but also a bonus of the Deathless liking me more. Not that it matters. I've been giving them tons of literature and stuff to skip the line, basically, to talk with them. I don't think any of them are Langley's lost lover. Let's drop off the crew of the boatmen. The headquarters of the Necropolis line are buried somewhere near the nave. The captain fiddles with her cufflinks as she accompanies you to the office of the Necropolis line. Her crew have scurried away. You don't have to come in, she says, not looking at you. But the manager is not going to be pleased. If you put in a good word, she trails off. You've arrived at the unobtrusive black-painted door of the office. The knocker bears a grinning silver skull. Inside, the office is funerary, draped in indigo and accented with fussy silver fixtures. The line manager looks up from his desk and glowers at the captain. Where the bloody hell have you been? It's been nine years. <laughs> Speak up for the captain. Captains ought to look out for each other. The line manager rants and rages till you manage to interject. Your mention of exceptional circumstances gives him pause, and your production of the captain's own log puts a stop to his complaints. He plainly does not believe you, but he seems afraid of anything in writing. He dismisses you both, but not without a significant reward for your trouble and your immediate departure. Outside, the captain deflates with relief. Thank you, thank you. I'll remember your kindness. The boatman is ready to take to the skies again, crewed only by the willing dead. I think that's it for all his quests. I think. I'm going to check my quest log in a minute, but let me get rid of a lot of this terror. I have 63%. Let's use my immaculate souls. 0%. That is so satisfying. Well, back at London. And I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return... I feel like I've searched pretty well for Langley's Lost Lover. Maybe I haven't searched enough in the Reach. I have one small idea that it could be the Ornithologist, or... Yeah, I think it's the Ornithologist at the Nature Reserve. So I want to explore that. Beyond that, I don't know. So, I might explore the Reach a bit, and then I think it's time to go off the map and continue the main quest. 